Okay. Uh, welcome to Tech Tuesday. Uh, today's presentation is uh, by the Internet of Things Forum. I'm Andy Sloat. I'm one of the tri chairs of the IoT Forum committee that plans these programs. Uh, on behalf of Tech Titans Forums, we hope you're enjoying our new programming concept, Tech Tuesdays, that's designed to showcase the technologies of our eight forums with cutting edge presentations like the one being brought to you today. Uh, mark your calendars for the second and fourth Tuesday of every month uh, during the noon hour for Tech Tuesday to be a part of this new and growing series. Quick mention of our next program, April 23rd, Health Tech Forum will be hosting Dr. Amy Jenkins, who's a program manager in Biological Technologies Office for the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, better known as DARPA. She'll be talking about DARPA's pandemic prevention platform and the role of technology innovation in preparedness. And that's just one of several upcoming events that you're gonna to wanna to attend. Check out our schedule on the website at techtitans.org. Uh, as a reminder, when we go through the presentation today, ask your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be posed to the speaker after he completes his presentation in the order they are asked. And uh, I encourage you to uh, put some questions in there. Um, we talked uh, prior to this, of course, to do a little planning and definitely looking for some dialogue around the topic today. After the program, you can remain on for an optional networking session. It's scheduled to start at one o'clock or as soon as we finish the main presentation. And then at the latest, we'll conclude that at 1.30. Program today is about leveraging IoT as part of the digital transformation. Many firms have deployed edge or IoT pilots, and in some cases moved into production with lower cost hardware and improved connectivity. But there are some challenges with security at the edge. And in most cases, companies fail to realize they do not own the data which makes it harder to factor and plan for scale. Our speaker today is an innovative technologist with an eye on the future who's focused on architecting solutions that are bottom line driven. John Archer is the chief architect for energy at Red Hat. He provides thought leadership for designing and improving next generation refineries, chemical plants, well pads, renewables, decarbonizing processes and healthcare facilities that leverage container and virtualization technology on Red Hat technologies. John's currently focused on developing intelligent solutions that leverage development, security and operations, and automation to build secure to edge with data science in the field. So to discuss how you can plan to leverage edge and IoT technologies to drive your organization's digital transformation, please welcome from Red Hat, John Archer. All right, can you guys uh, hear me okay? Hello. Yes. Yes. All right. All right. Hey. Uh, hey. Thank you very much for the for the uh, introduction there, Andy. And uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm learning. I'm still learning who the ten uh, tech titans are. Uh, but um, I know y'all been around for a while. It sounds like I know Lisa's been involved in your group for some time. But I just want to say th thanks for having us. And uh, um, you know, like to share as much as I can today with you guys about things we've been working on and some of our perspective, perspectives on this, you know, very exciting space. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of um, interest in edge or IoT technologies these days. Uh, I probably spend 30% uh, of my time uh, focused on, you know, edge and what all the impacts of that are. But, um, but I'll, um, you know, I'll, you know, I don't want to be just a talking head here today. If y'all want to ask, I, I, yeah, I was saying I actually propose maybe just make this like an AMA style thing. And uh, I think the question was, what's AMA? But, uh, but uh, yeah, if you have a question, you know, at your button to chat or, you know, feel free to pause me and just ask it. Uh, I'm assuming people can talk. I'm not sure what the setup here is, but if you have questions, you know, please pause me and, and we'll go. Hey, hey so. John, really quick. I'm seeing some things in the chat about static. Uh, yes. Yeah, is that still out there, or folks? I, I, I actually, I hate to say it, Andy. It's when you turn your your mic on is when we're going to really? start it. Really? Yep. Wow. Well, I better leave mine off. <laughs> but it's it's not it's it's low grade. It's not it's not like coming across real heavy. So. Okay. So, but uh, but in any case, um, yeah. When you when you uh, when you mute, we're 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 good. So, might even check your connections or something. All right. Can you guys uh, see the slide here? Yes, we can. 
Okay. All right. So, um, so I've got all like, the way I do things. I should probably only have like 10 slides for the amount of time I talk on, but I'm going to give this, this slide deck to you guys afterwards. There's more content here than we have time to get to, but I just wanted to share, share a full story. And, um, and, uh, and I, you know, I have a information overload in my head sometimes when some of these topics, um, but like I said, it's exciting. So that's part of the, part of the fun here. So, um, so I'm an energy guy, you know, I'm, born in houston you can't you can't avoid it right it's you know it's part it comes with uh you know being being born down here and uh but i'm an old just so you know i'm an old java guy like i i started the houston java users group back in 97 i still participate in that group but really the last few years i've been doing a lot more python when it comes down to you know hands-on keyboard type hacking and coding stuff but um i'm an old ba oracle guy silver stream for folks that go back that far uh, so I've been in enterprise Java space for forever. And uh, so when I've joined Red Hat, uh, I actually joined Red Hat just so, you know, I went to, I don't know if you know, a conference called OzCon, <clears throat> but OzCon was in Portland back in 2015. And I actually got a free pass because of my H. Judd uh, lineage there. And uh, I learned about Kubernetes there. And I was at Oracle, I was at Oracle Cloud guy at the time. And um, I learned, once I learned what Kubernetes was, I joined Red Hat within two months. And so... Uh, so OpenShift is our enterprise Kubernetes thing. And so that's really where I uh, mostly focus is just how to run containers and run containers at scale. And now what I've really been focused on is running containers anywhere. So, you know, mostly started, you know, in the traditional data center or in the cloud, but now we're building that stuff, you know, where make where where a customer has a problem is where we're trying to run things. So really at the end of the day, you know, edge and data science is where I spend the bulk of my time. But I have this, you know, uh, you know, used to build upstream data products uh, for energy customers, but I have spent time and I did a lot of DOD work in my past, uh, some healthcare, actually did a lot of e-commerce things for retailers actually in Dallas, like JCPenney's is one of my customers for a while. And, um, you know, worked with some other uh, companies uh, based in Dallas. Um, actually did a, uh, I'll, you used to be an RFID guy back when that was, I, I guess we called it a thing. Um, but, uh, you know, did worked with, um, with Brinks, for instance, and, you know, I went in there into the vault and we were tagging bags of money and we thought the use case was going to be around, uh, you know, prevention or loss, you know, and really at the end of the day, it was all about overtime, uh, reduction and making sure they could check people in, uh, and, you know, do the money counting uh, sequence faster. So, but, uh, so I've been in, you know, you know, uh, I was involved in uh, heavily in the um, RFID2 active tag and passive tags uh, that were trying to improve read rates, like in a pallet, say like HPE Inc. would have a real hard time reading the inside boxes of a pallet. So that was kind of something I've worked on back in my past. Uh, but what I've been doing here recently on the gas companies is really trying to modernize um, and build a, a reliable fabric for where I can run a workload anywhere they need. So that's in a plant, that's on the well pad, that's in the facility, and not have to build something bespoke each time. And um, you know, part of what, what we've been working on is, uh, we've changed our strategy quite a few times over the last five years working on this, but we've come up with a strategy now, and I'll talk about that here today some. So, but um, uh, stopping any questions here, um, a lot of my focus right now is on uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, use cases and ESG solutions. So environmental sustainability governance, it's kind of a new acronym for some folks, but a lot of it has to do with carbon capture. A lot of it has to do with uh, you know, decarbonization type uh, uh, scenarios. So the open footprint uh, thing in the open, open group is something where I spend a lot of my time too as well. So um, let me just give you kind of a, you know, kind of that more, um, you know, level set of where most, you know, and this is not just a Red Hat perspective, but, but I think this is what a lot of people uh, have, uh, particularly for well-established large organizations. Um, you know, their, their businesses are, are constantly under, under attack, right? There's uh, new business models always be coming up and there's different ways to, you know, skin that cat. And certain industries have been totally revolutionized, not just with edge technologies, but you know, and I'm including mobile phones in the edge story here. Um, but, you know, being able to do greenfield use cases can totally change, you know, you know, 
if you look, if you're a taxi driver or a taxi company, you know, what, 12 years ago, um, something happened there, right? And there's other industries where this type of thing has happened. And so part of what we try to do is try to like, you know, do Uber prevention, you know, or get you, get you ready uh, to be in case your business gets Uberized and um, making sure you're competitive. And um, so protecting, protecting your business model and preparing for those eventualities um, and then giving you the ability to not only build something, but build something where you could have unplanned success. So to be able to scale it or be able to secure it in a proper way, that's a lot of where I focus. And so um, at a high level, this is all, everything I'm talking about falls under this, this type of mentality and thinking, but a digital transformation program uh, is, is in, is really what works. I, I hate the term digital transformation, but at the end of the day, it is uh, leveraging this technology to uh, save and prepare your business for the eventual uh, uh, competitive nature that's coming around right to it. Um, so we talk about resiliency and resiliency is not a technical term in this case. It's your business case being resilient and that your business model truly can stand up to outside uh, competition. And, um, you know, there's resiliency in the systems too, obviously, but we're really trying to make sure your organization um, you know, I, I have a customer who's, you know, their, their stock ticker got pulled down off the S and P here recently. Right. So I work with Exxon mobile and they're no longer listed when there's a lot of things happening in oil and gas here. Uh, now, uh, you know, I, I know you guys are mostly Dallas based and that's where Exxon mobile's headquarters, but you know, that there's energy is a, a, a scenario where things are changing dramatically, not just due to, you know, technology, but to, you know, geopolitical things and for, um, you know, demand changes. We've had a massive demand change over the last year. And, uh, but energy transitions changing who they are and what they need to become. And you need to have the ability to change your systems accordingly to match these new business models and these new capabilities. And uh, that's where we, where, where we focus. Hey, John, you've got uh, obviously a uh lot to deal with on the technology side. How much do you find you have to understand the business of the customer you're serving? It, it can, do, you, do you need to get into knowing something about oil and gas, for example, and how things work, or can the customer expertise really fill the entire need there? So that's a great question. Um, so I have always used in my career, I, I always, you know, I state, I keep one foot in the business and one foot in the technology. Uh, if I can't relate to them uh, into a business owner in a meaningful way, I'm wasting everyone's time. Um, now, I'm never going to be the you know the geophysicist that can interpret seismic data, for instance. But um, understanding the macros at some level is always important. I think in any technology um, type of you know uh, career, um, you know technology for technology's sake. I think there's a lot of organizations that get trapped in that they're always trying to build the very best technical thing but if you can't map it back to the to a uh, you know that a resilient business model um uh, you you might be uh doing the wrong thing and uh, uh particularly when it comes to edge things i think a lot of people don't have a good understanding of what we call a hidden factory that happens uh, this is more of an industry 4.0 style way of thinking of things but how things get made, how things get produced, if you're not uh, hitting one of the macros that actually impacts the business and you're working on something that, you know, maybe you're making something a little bit better, but there's still some massive gap in the end-to-end -end solution, um, you're completely doing the wrong thing. And so uh, sometimes that's hard for some people to have that, that greater vantage point uh, to make an impactful change and, you know, prioritizing the work is is a constant that I spend more time trying to prioritize my own work with my with my customers right and it's it's uh it's something I've had to learn to do over the years because I always want to go chase the shiny fun thing right but um at some level if we're not aligned on what's going to be the be the real solution that's going to help the business um you know and sometimes the customer doesn't know right I'll, I'll be blunt Right. Some customers are like, yeah, we need to do this. And I'm like, well, no, you don't. But you have to have, you know, you have to have a different type of relationship to tell them they're wrong in some situations. But, uh, but does that help answer your question? 
Yeah, thanks, John. Okay. Yeah, and yeah, I think that's the you know one of the challenges. You know, we, we're doing a. I know there's a technology session. This is you know called Tech Titans, um, but uh, yeah, I think it's a. Uh, yeah, I think it behooves everyone to uh, master both sides. So, um, and uh, you know, be able to you know have an, an end result that uh, you know the the C suite likes just as much as the the lead architect likes. So. Um, so I, I think everyone's probably seen this. This is a very popular Dilbert commercial, but I think that's what we've seen a lot of our customers doing. They have a cloud strategy that is overemphasized uh, in a lot of cases, um, and it is the only strategy um, that they have when it comes to a technical spend or a strategy that they're trying to get to. Um, I, I think the, the the you know we we really try to advocate. You know, we you know, here, you know, obviously we talk about hybrid cloud and, you know, that includes edge solutions and, you know, the edge cloud is something uh, you'll, you'll see some stuff from us here. And uh, so, I'm, you know, the very last slide has a link to our Red Hat Summit, uh, but there's a, uh, a lot of new edge things coming out from Red Hat, you know, branding wise, product wise, uh, that I wish I could share all of it with you today, but it's embargoed right now. So if this thing had been two weeks later, we would have had some different content here. But I do want to tell you guys, we're, we part of what Red Hat's been doing, you know, we've been a data center company, right? That's really, if you really know what Red Hat is or know our history, um, you know, we're an open source, you know, we're the largest open source company out there. Uh, IBM bought us, we're still the largest open source company out there. Um, but what we've been doing is trying to figure out how to, from the bottom up, help people leverage software in the best possible way. And the innovation that software creates from open source is what we're really trying to harness and give you as a, a way to consume it as best you can for your particular business problem, right? That's, that's what Red Hat is. And, you know, Kubernetes is the like, thing I mentioned earlier on why I came here, because it's really trying to decompose all software in a meaningful way so you can scale it and fit it into um, you know, any, any type of scenario, be it COTS or custom. And, um, you know, for Edge, you know, running a secure container, basically at the end of the day, we're helping you run a secure container where you want to and choose the data gravity that you want and the, that fits your business model. And so at the end of the day, that's what I want. If you get anything from those talk, that's what we're focused on doing is providing that, that flexibility and, and leverage of you get to choose if you want to let the cloud vendor have access to your data. If you particularly these SaaS things, um, oh, let me let me skip ahead here a little bit. Um, these SaaS models around IoT data, particularly if you're using a SaaS product, uh, you have, may have maybe you just click through it, but you might be sharing all your data and not aware of that. Um, um, so that's one thing I'll, I'll you, know, you know I'm jumping around here a little bit, but. Um, one of the things I wanted to come back to um, off of this, most, like I say, the digital transformation organization is a high level, typically is equating either to an API strategy or a cloud strategy. And some people can't delineate the both, the, the, the two. Um, edge falls in the same batch. You want to be able to have edge APIs, uh, APIs that represent your edge events. Um, and, but at a high level, I wanted to mention that these digital transformation pro projects at, at, at a high level um, really come, uh, can, um, are, are typically still not, they're not, they're not successful. Um, we've got a lot of organizations that are still uh, enabling their folks to leverage the technology better. Um, but I'll, I'll say a lot of the, the challenges we see is just not, you don't have the right executive alignment uh, or support. Um, and uh, a lot of it has to do with, you know, trying to enable your organization in mass. Um, and it just, there's not the budget for it. There's not the time for it. And uh, people still trying to do their jobs as is. Um, but, you know, we've seen a lot of organizations that have like an agile or a dojo you know, type thing happen, but it stays in IT, right? It doesn't really, um, you know, if you do agile, if you don't have the business owners and the executives in the room too, then you're not doing agile, right? And that's that's one of the big things I always make sure, try to understand if, you know, particularly does your CIO report to your CFO, then automatically I know that organization's messed up, right? Uh, so I just, you know, not trying to be hateful, but that's that's a simple scenario where the, the cost 
is how they view IT, and it's not their business. The the technology is is got to change and um, how you view it. So, uh, and one last thing here, and I'll move into more of the tech, technical stuff. Um, but one of the things that we we see with digital transformation groups is really you can't do digital transformation in a, in a vacuum, right? And uh, the leaders where there is success are very open about their plans, allow for feedback, allow for bad news. Um, you know, there's something, if you've read the Accelerate book um, uh, by Norsham, she really talks about the, the Western Cultural Survey. I really believe that the, that Western Cultural Survey is a way to really understand if you really are an open organization. You know, Red Hat talked a lot about that and be able to understand, can you even do it properly? If you don't have that type of collaborative features and the right incentives for your people, you know, allow them to, you know, experiment and fail without recourse, uh, you can't do it. It just, it, it, it actually, it'll hurt your company. Uh, so uh, that's one thing we always want to kind of, we can coach you on that, but it's still, it, it has to have buy-in from up high to do these type of trans digital transformation projects. So, um, okay, so now let's get into the fun stuff. Is there any questions about that? I just wanted to kind of set up the the, the talk with, with the, the digital transformation type of vantage point. Okay. Um, okay, so anyone know anyone know why I have this slide up here, this uh, Oldsmore, uh, Florida uh, logo here? Anyone know a story about Oldsmore here from very, kind of, kind of recent? Is that where the water uh, system yes. was hacked? Yes, it was. It was, uh, you know, someone was able to remote in and uh, through TeamViewer, uh, able to adjust the sodium hydroxide valve uh, that treated their water. And actually they set it to a setting that actually would have been caustic and hurt, you know, harm, harm humans is what could have happened here. Uh, and the only reason it was caught is because the operator the sitting there saw his mouse cursor moving around. That's how he, that, that was the detection, was a, a visible cursor move on, on the uh, HMI screen. So, um, so this, these are the kind of things where, and I, I'm not trying to pick on old smart at all. Uh, this is a very common pattern, particularly in, in, you know, what I'll call traditional OT or, uh, you know, uh, some of these OT shops, um, you know, there's been changeover, uh, you know, the shift change has happened in a lot of these places and a lot of things are built and a lot of people inherited things they don't understand, right? They just know I click this thing and this works this way, right? And so the people that built the original OT uh, systems and technology are tech, were, you know, back when these things were built, they were tech professionals that understood it at a much lower level. And we're in a situation where the shift changes happen and for some organizations, uh, there's kind of like it's voodoo, right? For why these systems work the way they work. And so um, we're seeing a chance to maybe bring OT, you know, we, you've probably heard the term ITOT convergence, right? There's different concerns and cares and cultures between those two groups. And, but at the end of the day, the way to really modernize this and, um, you know, really attack this from, it's really, I'm going to get into the security things that need to change. But it's still a tech professional that understands the, the concerns from both IT and OT, right? And can represent them in a single architecture. And that's what we're focused on is, is if there's a, a tech professional that's gonna build the next modern um, autonomous edge eventing framework. Um, and that's that's what we're focused on. But um, in this case, you know, no one got hurt, but uh, remote desk soft, remote software allows those folks to come in and do their job without having to drive to the facility, right? So it's a remote operations tool, but uh, it's one of those things where uh, security needs to change. Um, so, uh, so I'll put this one. I kind of put the link on the bottom here, which ruined it a little bit. But uh, Saudi Ramco is a customer of mine in my past. Um, do, do you have? Do y'all know of any? Anyone know why I would have this slide up here? have their logo up here. So you can um, track, uh, you know, ICS cybersecurity uh, type topics. So th they actually were attacked by Iran, right? And, um, and, and Russia, right? 
using or excuse me, using a Russian uh, Snedkit kit. Um, you know, there's been multiple attacks on Saudi Aramco, and this is part of the reason they'll never go to the cloud, right? They had over thirty thousand systems wiped um, back in two thousand eight, I think, using the the this the a different um, exploit, and then but they keep getting attacked, right? And what's happened this time now is the firmware is the attack angle that's been used uh, to attack Saudi Aramco. So, Samurai, so if you don't know who Saudi Aramco is, they're the, really the end of the day, the largest oil and gas company out there. And, um, it, but we're having like a geopolitical, you know, wars uh, through systems now, right? Uh, we can look back at our politics and, you know, what happened with all the AI ML uh, bots on all the social networks as another type of attack. But at the end of the day, what's starting to happen is these attacks are increasing in numbers. They're increasing in the number of surfaces. They're getting to the point where people are overwhelmed by um, the the cost and how many systems and, and, and you know how many how many risk points are there. And um, when you start really like how most people have designed their systems. And I'm talking more about the brownfield ICS type of edge right now. Um, there's, you know, most people do this in a disconnected state today, and because of these reasons, right? So OPC UA Modbus data um, is typically in a, a lights out type of deployment. You know, using the old Purdue model for the most part. And uh, but there's so much value to be had if we could truly connect these things. We can't get to autonomous operations until we can connect to it. And we can't connect them until we can secure it properly at scale. And so, John? yes. Yeah, can I ask, I'm just curious. I mean, you brought up the point there that Aramco is not, will not move to the cloud from a security standpoint. Yep. Um, telcos talk about clouds, but they talk about them as private clouds. Do you, the cloud seems a data center, somebody else's cloud that I'm using seems yep. like an incredibly ripe target from the standpoint of how fast I can exploit that and move across multiple customers and, and just get penetration. Do you see that as a risk to the entire movement towards the cloud and that business model? Yeah, there, there's, um, you know, and I don't want to talk bad about any particular cloud, but we, they've gotten better, right, as an attack surface plane, but SolarWinds was through Azure Cloud, right? Right. The whole SolarWinds thing was a mess. It still is a mess. Uh, people don't even know they've been hacked still today, right? Um, there's uh, clean, and these companies are not good at, unfortunately, like this, this was Schneider, right? So Schneider was the attack thing with the firmware. Mm -hmm. And they say, because we have a proprietary operating system, we're really, we're really hard to attack. Well, that whole like obfuscation mechanism is not an excuse for bad security at the operating system level or at the firmware level. And so, but yeah, we start, we start, putting these things on homogenous cloud systems, one exploit explodes, right? And not only does it explode, but it explodes in a way where maybe your data wasn't anywhere else but that cloud. And if it's a, you know, one of these types of things that wipes the data, um, uh, you know, what happened at Ramco was a very damaging attack. Uh, and there's been some now, some of these types of things are now attaching ransomware and putting the ransomware along with the attack tools um, and it's getting, it's, you know, there's been a lot of attacks where there was one bug in the, in the um, script that could have made these things much worse, right? Like payloads weren't delivered. And so we, I think we've had enough of these, like, oh, it was kind of bad, but it wasn't that bad type of events now where, the, and everyone talks about, oh, well, they had this error in your payload exploit. Well, guess what? Now they know how to fix it. So it's it's the next round of attacks. I'm very worried. Uh, infrastructure, like, you know, we've had dams attacks. We've had electrical grids attacked. There's been proven uh, attacks uh, in EMEA from Russia to Ukraine. Uh, if you ever follow the uh, Dragos security guys, yeah. uh, uh, Robert Lee. So I worked with Robert Lee when he was still in the Air Force. And he was the first offensive cyber guy in DOD, right? Great guy. I mean, this guy's awesome. Like, if, you, if ever he lives, he was living in San Antonio. He's back up in Maryland now. But uh, their organization is doing a lot of good things to, um, like, augment your scene type of systems. 
uh, and they do honey pots. But they're if someone gets attacked, Robert's the guy they pull in to verify if it was a real attack, or did some operator you know download a virus or something you know something silly like that and self 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 own himself right. Uh, but um, uh, this area around you know uh, where where we're trying to um, you know, we want we want the benefits of the remote operations. We want to get into uh, being able to deliver these edge solutions that can actually change the valve remotely. Right? Most of the class, you know, most edge use cases where at Exxon are still class five and class four, but we're being asked to do class three now. And so to you know change the valve or um, you know you know do the remote operations is a is a uh, it's a different level of risk, and uh, but it it has such a it's a necessary place to go uh, because of the cost advantages it gives them, right? And so we're really looking at um, how to um, impact the the organization to leverage this technology, but then do it in a way that doesn't introduce risk. You know, I'll, I'll make this joke, and you know, actually, uh, the guy I work with Exxon will be in our second summit. There's a recording of him talking about uh, the what we've been working on with him. And this guy named David Hedge, and uh, you know he's helped. He's really been a design leader with us on our next version of our OS to be able to give this not only to their own solutions, like their custom greenfield stuff, but to get go talk to all the control systems guys. So like the Rockwells and KVBs and Siemens and Schneiders and all these guys. Um, but yeah, they all deliver a Linux, but they don't, they don't, the risk is yours, right? At the end of the day, the control systems are like share responsibility model in AWS is the same way. I should have, you know, got a slide here on that, but, um, the, the, the capabilities of, uh, the, the products that you use to build these edge solutions, it's your responsibility to secure the systems and the tools they're using that, that, that you can very easily connect up on all these cloud solutions. They're not hardened, and uh, so that's part of the risk. And especially when there's zero day uh, exploits that still come out almost like there's a whole new set of DNS exploits just got announced today for four different uh, edge operating systems uh, around DNS. And um, so this is it's a constant fight and a constant battle, and it, it, it's exhausting. So sorry if I'm if trying to. I don't want to make this sound like a sad story, but. Um, but it's tough. It's tough. Um, um, yeah. So here's kind of a list of you know the ICS attacks that people have been dealing with, and we've. But the thing is, they're getting they're getting they're getting tougher, right? They're getting more involved. Um, you know, if you're you know if you get it on the you get a firmware attack, sometimes you end up throwing the device away. Like it's it, you know, the device is trash, and so because you can't you can't get it off and it replicates itself. Um, so that's another area where we're, we're working on uh, trying to prevent that. Um, so, um, and yeah, here, here's that share, just talking about shared responsibility model. So and if, if you're running like Greengrass, for instance, so the orange things is what AWS care, cares about and helps you with. Everything in blue is your job, right? And so expertise on this, particularly when they keep changing the underlying service components, and it's really kind of a, you know, um, you know, a SaaS thing where you do, it's kind of a black box at some level, what's really happening to that. Um, now there's people selling or, or building hardened Linux images that you can run on AWS and hardened other things up the stack, but it's still, it's something you're chasing uh, constantly with these things. And so we want to get a, a, a full um, a full pedigree on the software from end to end. And so Red Hat just announced a project called SigStore which is trying to be able to sign everything end to end, in, including the stuff we do ourselves. So you can sign your own content, for instance, with you know signature tools and stuff like that. But to be able to do a full pedigree and be able to align on validating the the you know every single you know every line of code that has been built and deployed, those binaries, all of it could be signed through SigStore. So that's a project uh, us and Google have started. Uh, to try and you know improve that in specifically for around open so open source software projects because we pull a lot of open source software in to build our products and so we need that full repudiation or pedigree uh, of the full chain so um so um so let me talk about this so uh, uh, i don't know if you guys are 
fans of, of Clint, but uh, I, I, his movie comes on, I have to stop and watch it. It's, just, it's a problem I have. Um, but it really, the, one of the big things around all this data on the edge being created, uh, it really is a wild west in terms of who owns the data, right? Um, some of the things that we that we deal with is I've got customers that are fully don't care. Like you use my data to build your products, right? If you go back and look at GE Predicts, that was their business model was to try and own all the industrial IoT data. Um, if you use a smart sun TV, it's listening to every conversation you have. If you have all the you know the the echoes and the all the different uh, little speakers slash uh, you know, Siri devices, uh, you've opt in to giving them your, you know, what you're talking about in your house, in the personal home. Um, and there's other things around this. Like if you're on Android system, you can't, um, yeah, you know, like your data about how, what you're doing on the phone and what things you're buying, what apps you're buying is also part of their product, right? So going back to like, you know, you know, you know, what is Facebook? You know, what do they sell? And who, you know, they, they sell you, right? And so same thing here with some of this IoT data. Uh, you can't you can't use Samsung Pay without turning that you can't you have to turn this thing back off, which then allows them to sell your data to their partners. Um, <clears throat> now there's other ways to handle this and we can help build, we've got things around federated learning and other ways to secure the data to address some of this stuff. But you know, personal consumer devices is one thing. But there's companies out there looking to do that with industrial data right now. Um, and there's, I mean, there, you might be totally fine. That might be great for your business to have them to give you better models that they sell back to you. But in the case of some of these edge solutions, you're paying to send the data, you're paying to process the data, you're just paying to store the data. And if you want to do a more advanced AI ML, you pay a premium for that on some of these clouds. And then if you ever want to get data out of there, you pay a much larger premium to get the data back out. And so think about that sometimes. And, and really, I've seen situations where customers have built and prototyped and built a great solution on Azure IoT. And they did it for, you know, 10 devices. Then they went to go scale it up to the real number and then it totally invalidated the business case. Um, so not saying you, you can't, there, you know, there's great things about Azure IoT, um, but be careful, do, 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 you know, work it in reverse sometimes to really understand what your scaled out solution is going to look like and making sure you're making the right type of architectural decisions uh, based upon some of that. And so um, so those are some, some of my caveats to, to everyone um, to understand all that. Um, so uh, one thing that, you know, uh, you know, kind of looking ahead, this is kind of like we're, the, you know, talking, going back kind of more to digital transformation story. Um, there's this term, you know, GE and some other companies have you know, used it called digital twinning. Uh, to do digital twinning in industrial space and automotive, and um, uh, there's you know entertainment itself. Uh, but you know I've worked mostly with uh, energy for companies or utility companies. Uh, this is where the this is the state of art today is how to make this easier and start trying to build standards around digital twinning. Um, at the end of the day, it's really just metadata about the thing, right? Um, in the case of some industries, they have uh, operational standards like Mimosa, for instance, which they say, if you're using this device from us, here's your operational thresholds. And that would be something you want to be able to inherit into the digital twin uh, model. And uh, But when you have all this telemetry data about your thing, uh, and the, uh, you really want to have the events to be auto-triggered based upon those threshold events. And if you start getting to autonomous production use cases, you want to be able to ensure that you're not going beyond what the, you know, the, what your legal or insurance guys will cover if you operate it differently than the intended use, right? So running a motor at a certain you know, frequency or a certain rate might be something that's in the guidelines. So if you break your thing, you obviously have non-productive time, which we're all trying to avoid with these predictive uh, maintenance models. But we want to get to the point where we can do digital twin in the edge and not have to backhaul all that digital twin data, right? So another thing with the cloud is ensuring that you're only sending the events that need to be stored like in your ERPs or are relevant for an auditing purpose, right? Um, 
keeping the, you know, I think the understanding the data traffic that these things can generate. We've got, um, you know, we've got some some drilling use cases and some well pad well production use cases that's requiring per second uh, production metrics per well, and it's in an insane amount of data. And so these kind of things are, you know, it's a, I think some EMC uh, lobbyists, <laughs> you know, designed this thing, but. Uh, there's scenarios like that where you know, I always wanted people to understand, you know, we have the ability to go collect all this telemetry, but everyone needs to understand what should you really be connect, uh, collecting. And part of the trick is to ensure that you can push the processing to the edge. That's why this edge thing is really exploding so that we can have real-time events, you know, business events, not technical events or telemetry events um, that we can quickly and easily turn on, but then only, you know, report in when something's, out, out of that threshold. And so uh, that's the idea of the twins. And uh, so John, it sounds like for, you know, some of those uh, instances, obviously, we're talking about some pretty serious computing power at the edge, right? I mean, it's, yep. it's going to have to be uh, pretty stout to handle uh, a full fledged digital twin or to handle something on the level of that, uh, that use case you just talked about. Uh, it, it depends on the use case. Um, we've we we've been doing a lot of opt like um, um, I'll I'll use this as a good story. Um, uh, we we work a lot with Intel and, and, and Nvidia, right? Those are two companies I work with a lot around federated learning, but computer vision uh, typically. Um, like I, you know, we did a use case. I've got you know one of my customers has got over two hundred twenty different use cases. Well, about one hundred ninety five of them have a computer vision component. And uh, I mean, you can basically melt some of these edge boxes trying to keep up and do processing uh, of, on some computer vision use cases. You know, Intel has its Movidius line and AMD has AGX and, you know, some of the you know, basically GPU in, on the edge, um, which still is not great from a power thing. But what we're getting into is be able to optimize the ML inferencing model that would be deployed on the edge as a container to simplify and reduce not only the compute required, but to be able to optimize and target the uh, scenario. So you can make very simple uh, decisions about that without a whole lot of um, back and forth, right? And um, so like OpenVINO is the Intel project where we can optimize the model and target the actual target hardware and optimize as best we can. Um, if you saw actually in NVIDIA GTC is going on this week right now, there's tons of new announcements uh, around NVIDIA capabilities in this space as well with computer vision and uh, fleet management uh, use cases. And so we're, you know, we're working to support those as well. But uh, yeah, there's use cases still where there's not enough compute that makes sense. The use case is too grand, uh, you know, if you think of it that way. But, um, you know, there's, a, I think we're getting better at recognizing the patterns and recognize when someone's gotten you know, kind of architect, I can't talk, where they've architected themselves into a corner uh, with an edge use case, particularly around video and image and audio processing. Uh, you know, listening for vibrations and heat. So, you know, be, you know one of the, the, the use cases I, I've worked on is where we've got the ambient humidity and temperature coupled with um, how the machine metrics are going for manufacturing for pipe. Right, that's one of the you know, use cases we've been working on, where particularly if the the yesterday's pipe and today's pipe won't fit, is because of humidity change within seriously in temperature change within a, just a fraction of a few degrees. And for pipeline guys, that that that's that's bad, and so we're trying to ensure uh, you know when they start manufacturing, they're not going to have uh, sections that won't fit together and. Um, so there, there's there's all kinds of great use cases where, um, and you know, I'll say this too about being at IBM, we got access to weather.com APIs here, which was one of the most, I'm a big weather geek and I was very happy to, they gave me a weather.com account. And so uh, if you're on the weather underground, there's a lot of data there that's, that's open source you can pull in, but um, building a digital twin for a manufacturing industrial use case, being able to give them insights into how they do their, their work uh, through a, you know a twin type concept um, is is usually where they're at today. There's a lot of people have there's not a lot of like turnkey things like this. There's a lot of building block projects out there, 
And uh, but this is this is one of those spaces where um, you know you know I, I like to work on these. So these these are always fun. Um, okay. So any questions about that? Was there any? I saw something in the chat. Okay. We good? Okay. I'm gonna keep moving. Then. Okay. All right, so um, so let me talk. You know, I don't want to make this salesy, but you know, I've been to. We're really helping you just put put your secure container anywhere you want, um, and that. So there's different types of edge that we talk about. Um, you know, and each each organization or each type of organization defines edge differently. Uh, you know, obviously, if you're talking to a telco organization, there's some very specific terminology there, like MEX and you know RAN and all that stuff, but uh, what is an edge to you could be a single user with their phone. It could be an IoT gateway. It could be a uh, an ICS device, um, or it could be a, a whole cluster, right? So we're we're helping try to support all those different configurations, but not doing things bespoke per each one. We want to be able to have a heterogeneity, excuse me, homogeneous capabilities, but with heterogeneous hardware, if I can say that right. So be able to target it, you know, the smallest device out there. You know, we've got some stuff running on pies and beetle bones now, all the way up to the full class, you know, super domes and whatnot. So, um, so at the end of the day, what we're focused on is kind of helping build that that edge ops story or ML edge ops story, um, and be able to allow you to place the the contain the, the application where you need to. And this is, you know, it's Python based, it's C based, it's Java based, it doesn't matter. Um, and uh, be able to do this through an automation pipeline. So build automation around it all. That's where Red Hat excels. And um, you know, when we typically talk to an OT person, though, and we start saying DevOps type things, you know, they're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> You're going to automate my whole job, right? And so there's there's that cultural going back to the thing I mentioned, cultural differences. Um, you know, some of the organizations I go to, they have a, you know, they got a whole manual. They've printed out how they set up their edge like in a plant or whatnot. Uh, and really at the end of the day, that could be a single Ansible playbook or a TechCon pipeline. And so those are the kind of things where you find paper in an edge scenario, there's an, there's an opportunity there. Um, well, I say there's, there's paper anywhere. There's a, there's a project there. But uh, where you see these manuals about how to set these things up, um, that's what we've been working on is, is um, helping some companies move away from Windows process controls into Linux-based process controls with full automation and still be able to talk to the same OPC UA protocols, Modbus protocols, Canvas protocols, whatever, and pull that telemetry data in and then publish it wherever it makes sense. So that's how we see this stuff. Um, um, some of the, the challenges around this uh, we see is how to do this at scale, how to do that. You know, I just talked about some of the heterogeneous uh, hardware. You know, make sure we can support as many type, types of devices out there to be able to pull in different solutions from edge ISVs. Uh, we're really starting on that area. Uh, I've been working with uh, Matricon. It's a uh, uh, Honeywell division and they have a, a Linux based process control now that's actually containerized. So if you've got someone who's got a, you know, the, you know, I think the folks that are dealing with windows process controls, all the CVEs come up are usually about windows or .NET type issues. Um, and so by moving to a Linux process control, they can get into, um, you know, actually do more on the device, you know, be able to put some of the processing, like some of the ML inferencing on the same device as the actual uh, aggregation point. And uh, that's something that's been uh, uh, interesting for some of my customers. Uh, but be able to do this repeatedly, do it, have a, have a real practice around uh, the automation for deploying edge applications. And at the same time, be able to automatically patch if a CVE comes out without having to lift a finger. And um, that's really where the value comes for some of these guys is a better protection and securing those workloads. Um, some of the ways we do the security at the container level itself creates some improvements of using Podman versus Docker, for instance. Uh, but we're doing some other things on the stack to do full encryption on the edge, to do things like secure boot, green boot, use a TPM2, uh, have full, one of the biggest things we've done is make RHEL where it rolls back. So if you patch the OS, uh, you can now do a do it in a transactionally safe way. So you know, we're working on being able to do that 
at, in a canary style. So just like the way our phones update, we'll be able to update a RHEL Linux box through like a phone OTA style update. So over the air, do a percentage rollout, make sure it's good, and then fully roll it out to all the devices. And no one has to be running around the USB stick. That's, you know, that's, I, in a day I want to call, uh, I want them to call it like no truck rolls OS or something. But, um, but that's something that we've been, um, been working on with uh, Exxon Mobile. So um, any questions about that? That's, uh, that's one of the, you know, the key things I want to have folks understand that, you know, we have um, this green boot and RPM OS tree features that allows you to do incremental updates for your, for your host OS and then be able to do it um, uh, like with that, you know, kind of like an, you know, green, blue or AB style mechanism of having two OSs that are patching um, uh, with a, with a full rollback to the OS patch. So that's, that's, that's kind of like, that's a very recent change to, uh, to Ralph Ridge. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so at a, I'm, I'm going to skip ahead. How much, how are we doing on time? I think we're, Come up to Ed. Let me skip ahead a little bit here. Okay, so I want to talk a, a story here. I, I'd rather tell stories and talk about the technology. Um, so we've been working in automotive uh, with a lot of a lot of different automotive companies, and we're, we've got a partner here, DXC. That's um, you know great, great you know for folks that new they're in Dallas, you know the old EDS folks and HPES. You know I've worked with uh, DXC and HPES in, in my time. I actually used to work at DMDC, which was the first EDS account uh, in the Seaside, uh, California. So, I've, you know, so I can say I've done a little too much work with uh, EDS. But um, in any case, uh, so this group has been working on the self-driving car uh, type story and be able to put sensors in the car to be able to process them in real time. Um, the amount of data that we're trying to be able to process is on, on you know it's it, it's 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 too big it's it's a lot of data uh now only gas i have some a lot of data when it comes to seismic uh as well you know but you know 230 petabytes is what we're trying to support and have you know each little station handle 50 petabytes every two weeks and so so have kind of like a distributed version and then an aggregated version and right, so we're really we're really stressing out the network we're really stressing out uh, the compute in some ways and trying to figure out how to find, you know, needles in the haystack is what we're trying to do and be able to improve the models real time continuously, right? We want to have those ML models just get to the point where, um, you know, accent, you know, obviously the, you know, things, it's been, you know, Tesla's got a lot of models out there where it will, it's trying to improve the driving, like when it, there's fog or there's rain or it's dark, and so that's, you know, the, most of these models are great when it's sunny, but it's, it's, it gets complicated when the lines on the road are, are not well painted or you have these weather conditions. And so improving those models is key to having the self-driving cars uh, really take off. Um, there's a link in, in I'll, I'll share this out. You'll be able to click these links. There's some videos you can actually see what they did. Uh, this was featured um, here a little while back, but you know, we, we've done some of these very high scale very competitive type of scenarios, uh, but this is just one industry, right? Um, yeah, this is kind of the high level architecture. I also have the link here too, uh, but yeah, we're using TensorFlow um, um, model, ML models, so due to computer vision through it. There's also some open CV uh, work inside of it as well, not just TensorFlow, but be able to build those models and have those models update real time is, um, is what we're trying to do. So be able to deploy that inferencing to the vehicle and then have it feedback and ingest new, new data to do new models uh, is, is the project here. Now, I would love to see a federated learning between multiple automakers. Uh, I think that would dramatically improve the models for auto, uh, but they're not quite there yet as, a, uh, as, as an industry. Um, but in the day, we're you know, providing the tools that data engineers and data scientists can use and deploy their work out to the edge. Um, so this is um, this is a, this is a very common pattern. You know, this, we were doing this for different types of data sets, different feature sets. Automating the building of the feature sets is something we're trying to improve as well. Uh, in this one, they did use MapR. Now MapR has 
know, kind of, you know, deflated here a little bit, but that could be any data lake or any big data appliance in that scenario uh, through some of the interfaces that we have. Um, let me move ahead here just a little bit more. So, um, so here's, here's, if you look at it, you know, where we're really focused, these are kind of the areas that, um, you know, the use cases that we've been pulled in on and that we're focusing on as an organization. So the, the largest one is telco and building private 5G RAN, uh, I think is, is our largest target. Um, so we're heavily involved with a lot of the telcos here, well, globally. And uh, we've got some uh, partnerships there and, uh, you know, depending on what type of use case, um, you know, public and private 5G is being used, uh, being powered by uh, Red Hat technology, I think in almost all those uh, major telcos. Um, but where I've been focused is more these industrial manufacturing use cases um, and uh, pulled in a little bit on some retail and healthcare ones. Um, and obviously the automotive one there I talked about. Um, so these are these are the different edge and the different scenarios there on the right. What what the topics or the architectural concerns typically are, but it's really we've been really focused on how to, um, you know, do that zero touch provisioning and manage multiple clusters globally on a single pane of glass. And so um, that's 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 where we focus. Um, there's going to be some announcements here in two weeks on some of this that I wish I could have shared with you today, uh, but um, yeah, look for that. Uh, coming out soon. Um, so if when we boil it down, you know, really talking about RHEL and OpenShift and, but the, the different locations where you can run these things are listed there below. Um, what this really looks like is really just, you know, small footprint devices all the way back into clusters, right? Uh, we are working on a new project called Snow, uh, single node, single node OpenShift. Uh, where, so basically we're putting OpenShift on a diet, uh, if you think of it that way. Uh, or you can think of it as kind of a, um, well, we've been using the term micro shift as well. So, but these are the, the, the technology that powers these use cases. Um, how you deploy it is kind of like, here's kind of the topologies we, we, we work in. And, you know, different, org different verticals might have different terminologies here, but for the most part, you know, these solutions fit in all those tiers. And what the most important thing is what we're not doing we're not, we're not doing microcontrollers, right? We're not, you know, you know, we do soft RT or soft RTOS, but we're not an RTOS provider. So, uh, but everything else, that's that's where we sit. So, so kind of, uh, here's kind of a, a, you know, kind of a go forward, you know, reference architecture. Um, you know, we've got different um, ways of deploying the AIML with the edge. And so you can use, you know, connect your sensors up to the edge devices and then publish that data to an aggregation server. Now where that AIML aggregation sits, um, how you build your models would be on there and then pushing those inferences out back to those devices. That's in a very simple, simple layer. We, if we look at this a little bit more, we're including a data science platform based upon an open source project called Open Data Hub. And this allows you to build at those ML models and deploy them um, very easily. And that's a meta operator in OpenShift um, to be able to deploy and then leverage GPUs if you need it to accelerate the building of those components. That's part of what OpenShift can do. And uh, also build butcher storage where you need it. Again, going back to my initial comments. Um, and then if you get, kind of open up that onion there a little bit, these are some of the things that make up that, that those capabilities. So obviously it's built on our Kubernetes and that allows you to do software defined networking, uh, you, know, you know, really abstract away the compute and the storage as well. And so you can add those as you need or see fit. But then on the top there, those are all the data science, uh, you know, data ingestion, data engineering tools, as well as the ability to then uh, build those ML models and deploy them where you need them for computer vision or whatnot. You know, simple, simple vibration detections are something we have as a AI library inside the Open Data Hub, for instance. And so you can do uh, anomaly detection off of that like vibration detection. And we have a reference architecture for how you can use that through our edge uh, uh, blueprint for manufacturing. So um, I think I'm at time. Um, there's a few more things here that uh, I'll share the deck here with you guys. Um, 
but um, uh, here. So I just want to say thanks. Um, thanks for having me. Um, and um, uh, I guess we'll open it up to the networking section now. Is that, is that? Yeah, is that John, uh, we uh, have uh, scheduled till 1.30 for some networking and discussion. And uh, if you can hang on for that, that'd be sure. great. And uh, just want to thank you again, though, for doing this and, uh, you know, uh, giving us uh, a great presentation today and certainly a complex topic that uh, is uh, in the forefront. But I think a lot of companies and tech professionals are wrestling with it. It's a it's a it's a big it's a big topic to understand thoroughly. Yep. Yeah, there's there's like there's a lot of innovation in this space. Um, you know, a lot of different, arch like there's a lot of IoT platforms out there, right? And trying to pick through those is, is tough because there is so much innovation, it's changing so quickly. And so, um, you know, we're trying to make it easier, more consumable through things like the, you know, the Open Data Hub and some of the edge pattern, the, the edge blueprints that we have. And so, um, you know, we can, you know, if anyone's interested in those, obviously we can get you the links to that and, or sit down with you and go through them. But you know, Elisa hopefully gave you some of the perspectives we have on, you know, how to prioritize the work and, you know, you know, there's a lot of value when it comes to the, you know, having, you know, you know, I always say you can't manage what you don't measure or monitor, right? That's the key. That's a starting point with all this, right? Is having visibility to where's my things, where's my people, where's my, how's my process running? And so that's what all this stuff promises, but um, you know, there's, there's ways to do it where you don't create risk for yourself, um, either from the business model you select or from uh, the security. Right. So mm -hmm. hopefully that, hopefully that, that story came through. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, John. Hey, from a connectivity perspective, have you, uh, had any, uh, experience with LoRaWAN? Yeah, actually. Yeah. We, we actually have a project, uh, where we've been, um, uh, I'll, pull, I'll pull that up. Uh, we've got a Red Hatter who's actually done some work using that. Uh, and we've done that in uh, some of those German companies uh, there. And, um, but yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we're, we have uh, projects like an Eclipse IoT, for instance. Um, those, so I didn't really talk about the, pro, you know, the open source project or consortium that much, but um, the, yeah, LoRaWAN's a, one of those protocols that we, um, support you know all the sd wan stuff as well is important to all this uh you know, obviously lte and 5g as well from a connectivity standpoint but managing the radio is um a big part of like all the nfe in the mech stories uh, so um but i'll find that um uh, laura wan project if i can remember the name of it <laughs> so but yeah it's um i i myself uh, have only played with it a little bit. Um, most of my most of my folks are still just um, doing. Um, uh, I have most most of my IoT stuff is Modbus and OPC mm -hmm. stuff I've been working with. Okay. Some Canvas, some Canvas. Yeah, with LoRaWAN, a lot of uh, times we think about the distance capabilities that it has for connections, but uh, obviously can also be used. Uh, indoors and you know closer environments uh it, it has some good applications there too yeah there's a i think we have a rust we just did a rust implementation for lower wind setup uh here we go i'll post i guess i can post this in the chat Here's the chat Yeah, this is more of a blog post, but you can check it out here. So this is a real simple example. Yeah, yeah. So this guy Jens Ryman in here, he's a guy that's doing the uh, the newer the newer uh, Rust implementation for LoRaWAN. Okay. So, um, um, any any questions? I, I know we hit a lot of different topics here. Um, yeah, it's. It's hard to figure out what things to, you know, there's a lot of things I didn't get into too, but um, is there anything y'all wanted to hear that we didn't get to? 
This is Lisa. I just want to mention we've come a long way with open source. I think we did our first open source topic at the tech on the third Friday luncheon about 20 years ago. <laughs> and here we are, you know, having to have several uh, sessions on open source and at the edge just to comprehend it all, right? So we've come a long way with open source. Yeah, yeah there's, 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 seriously, there's too many open source projects now. It's, it's <laughs> it hurts my head. So, but, uh, <laughs> Used what, to what be about, to get people to talk about it. Now we can't stop talking about it. What about 5G, John? You know, there's uh, a lot of presentations and hype and thoughts about 5G. And it seems like uh, in the real uh, world of implementations, there, there, no one's really sitting around waiting for it necessarily, nor is it a good, is it a good strategy to wait for it, right? Yeah. No, we, we actually have, so our part of our challenge is, you know, we're not the hardware vendor, right? Um, we're purely the software vendor when it comes to 5G. And, you know, we have partners that are delivering um, the networking components, the radios, and then we do have full, um, you know, what we're calling 5GC, uh, where we've decomposed all of the NFV functions and the microservices on OpenShift. Wow. And that snow project I mentioned earlier is explicitly for 5G uh, deployments. So skinning it, getting skinning them down into fitness smaller mechs is is our. Uh, and, you know, I might be saying stuff I shouldn't be saying, but uh, the the yeah the the com there's a common 5G platform we have which does all the scalable um, uh, you know 5G apps, all the NFV stuff. For, for public or private uh, 5G, right? So we're, like I said, that is our use case number one when it really comes down to it that we're that Red Hat engineering is chasing. We moved over, what, between hiring and moving engineers around, we have over a hundred different engineers working on 5G at Red Hat. Um, and, um, and, you know, some of the, the larger telcos here in the US um, are basically uh, patiently waiting on us to finish some of the work that is in snow. So, um, and so that'll be, that'll be nice when that's delivered. It'll actually, it's, we've committed to having it in tech preview in OpenShift 4.8. So the next release will have access to this, um, this capability. And um, if you go to next.redhat.com, there's actually the first public data on MicroShift there, which is the, the snow delivery. So what we're doing is, you know, like I said, putting OpenShift on a diet but also using static pods. And that's the two main differences between traditional OpenShift and what we're doing to support 5G. <clears throat> but yeah, there's, uh, you know, putting, be able to go build, um, you know, your, um, you know, all the different network function apps and having that out of the box uh, and doing with automation, of course, that's, that's, that's where we're, that's what we're focused on. Oh. All right. Does anybody have anything else uh, for discussion? Yeah, and I could talk. All, I could talk beer brewing or woodworking too. We don't have to talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> beer brewing and woodworking, huh? Those I, I like talking about those as well. So. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, it's uh, it, it before when you were talking about edge, uh, it was interesting. Uh, you talked about edge processing, and I think you referenced uh, a phone. And uh, there was a, uh, I'm I'm uh, a couple levels deep in technology, but nowhere near where you are. But I got into a debate on LinkedIn, and uh, some of these folks were saying that uh, they had a very strict definition of the edge and edge processing, and you know, they said that processing some data on a mobile phone that was an edge, you know, processing. And it's just, and like I, I, I did some more looking after that and found, you know, a director at IBM who had a significant role in edge saying a very generic definition of it and other generic definitions. And, you know, I equated these people's argument to kind of like saying, you know, you're going to defend a hill and you're standing there and you're watching while everyone 
runs around, you know, the sides of the hill and keeps going, you know, it just yeah. it doesn't really seem to make any sense to get into, you know, a, a, a argument that says that edge processing is, is a very strict thing, you know. I think there's a, there's actually, there's a, you know, uh, to give my IBM, uh, rich, give my rich uncle some, uh, some credit. They actually have built some solutions that take, uh, you know, there's a, a version of this thing that's uh, just a Wi-Fi device. It's not a phone. Uh, I can't remember. It's like a, it's an iOS device at the end of the day with a GPU on it and a very good camera. And they use that to do computer vision in a manufacturing model. So they're deploying ML models to an iOS device. Um, and it's actually very good economics because to build it, to go get the NVIDIA AGX device, which has an accelerator, uh, accelerated GPU in it as well. Um, this actually is better for hardened. It's better for the, like, uh, the environmental issues they have. And it's better power consumption. Now, getting it mounted and getting it all hooked up is, is kind of a, um, uh, you know, not ideal, but uh, it, it's, it's, it's challenging how people see these devices. And particularly if you get like old, a little bit older one, that GPU is still more powerful and better power story than a lot of other devices that would do the same thing. And so, um, um, so that's a, you know, that's a, it's a Maximo uh, computer vision uh, little add on that they, that they sell kind of more, more like a low code, no code for doing computer vision use case. And, uh, but I, you know, I give them credit for recognizing and leveraging the Apple GPU chipset. Uh, there's a lot of innovation that's been packed into these phones or, or you know, edge device. Uh, is a, is a, this is an edge device. It has a, an accelerometer in it. It has a temperature device uh, measuring thing in it. It has all kinds of sensors. Um, and, you know, same thing for our watches. These watches have tons of sensors and telemetry in them. And so uh, I don't think we should narrow down, you know, the traditional ICS devices or all these new class of IoT gateways as the edge, right? The edge can be um, anything that has an IP to me and is outside the data center is an edge device, so. Yeah, I agree. Hey, okay. Andy, Andy, this is Paul. Uh, why don't we uh, um, ask John to take his slides down. Let's oh. open it up. People can turn off their mics and join in the conversation a little bit. You know, hey, guys, John, Russ Donnelly here. I've got a question. Um, what, what are you seeing from your customers or what are you hearing out there in terms of private networks being a connectivity solution for these guys? You know, so, today with private LTE or CBRS, are you seeing that as, as a requirement? Yeah. Um, and also, I would include LOSAT um, into the story as well. Um, um, you know, I've had, you know, Shell's been very public about their uh, WiMAX and LTM stuff uh, for a while now in countries where there is not a public uh, network. Um, so uh, they're setting up towers and, and I, I joke around with some guys at ExxonMobil, everyone misspells ExxonMobil with the E at the end and they want to own that. And so they're starting trying to subsidize some of their infrastructure investments in certain countries by actually becoming a provider uh, like in Angola and places like that. Um, but yeah, no, the, the certain workloads where there's not a uh, dependable, uh, you know, like, like a well in South Dakota, they'll use LTE, right? Uh, but it's not reliable in some use cases where it's a, like a well pad and they're doing a hundred wells in one place. They'll, they'll go invest, you know, into building a private network there with, with their own private radios. Um, so it just depends on where they're deployed and what's available to them. But, um, you know, so that's, you know, an oil and gas kind of uh, vantage point. But uh, I think that same logic applies. It's, it's opportunistic, right? It's, this is work to our needs or not, right? And um, um, obviously, you know, smart cities and stuff like that are requiring a lot of networking infrastructure to get some of these use cases powered properly. Uh, that's another, you know, public, you know, the public infrastructure bill that the federal government is now proposing uh, could dramatically change things here in the U.S. We go to other other countries. There's just tons of capabilities, like in in South Korea, that we can't. Like I don't know if anyone's been to South Korea recently or Japan even, but they have services that 
who are amazing, right? Uh, through some of these smart city initiatives. And uh, we're playing catch up here in the US um, to, to get to that kind of mentality in the infrastructure needed to support those type of apps and use cases. Thanks. Yeah, so I think it's a very good place to go invest. <laughs> I'll say yeah. it that way. Um, any, anyone else got any questions about woodworking? No, I'm sorry, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. Well, it sounds like we might uh, we might be out of questions then. Um, was this was this too was was I too too uh, too high or too low or? Uh, what, you know, John, it's really uh, it's always uh, a varied audience, and I think we saw that today too. Yep. And. Uh, you know, the, uh, I appreciate the stories, you know, and the uh, talking about the implementations and those resonate with some people. Mm -hmm. Other folks uh, who are more deep technically than me, you know, some of this stuff resonates with them. So I think you hit a good uh, variety of levels there. And, and, and that's really what we look for a lot. And so I appreciate that. Okay. John, I'll say, I'll just add this is that I um, was surprised to see the breadth of what Red Hat is doing. Um, I tend to think of you guys as Linux support. Yeah. So from way back when, so if everybody uh, does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that was a, uh, so I've reached out to you on LinkedIn, love to catch up with you a little bit and understand a little bit more about what you've got going on there. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. When I joined Red Hat, you know, that's what I, I was like, yeah. And then, you know, cause I, I ran, I, I, I think I ran uh, two, two, six, you know, it was an enterprise. This was, you know, Red Hat Linux, right? Back in the day, I had Yellow Dog, and then I got two six. Uh, I can't remember how, how old I was in, but um, yeah, I, me too. I was the same way. And I, I remember um, when JBoss was acquired by Red Hat, and that's when I knew things had changed somewhat. But uh, once I understood the uh, Kubernetes um, contributions, mm -hmm. um, that that's that's what really opened my eyes. It was uh, understanding how they were going to be. In this position to 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 really capture the container, you know, I you know, I use VMware ninety nine too, and so I can claim that. But uh, that's back when it was just Phoenix Bio Simulation. But this the shift change around workloads uh, from virtual machines to containers is is what Red Hat's strategy uh, in the day is, and it's really you know now it's a locationless thinking to, to where those workloads might be. So, um, but yeah, yeah, definitely like to catch up with anyone uh, here and, um, you know, like to help out any way I can with anyone um, with their projects or efforts. So. All right, great. If there's uh, nothing else, I guess we'll close up then, Paul. Sounds good, John. Thank you so much. I thought that was extremely informative. Also want to thank Henbitha for helping us uh, get things organized uh, on your team. And to Lisa Danzer for uh, for bringing Red Hat back into the organization. Good to have you back at some of these, Lisa. And never a dull moment. I like to hang out with the thought leaders for long periods of time, right? Yeah, Absolutely. Cool. Absolutely. So uh, anyway, thanks, John. We'll do this again sometime. Get an update so down the road sometime, perhaps. Yeah, well, if y'all want to play with any of this stuff, let us know. I'm sure Lisa well, and Anita will uh, let y'all play play with the. Uh, there's, you know, setting up a lab to play with some of this edge stuff is uh, is a lot of fun. And uh, sounds like it. Sounds like it. Yep, sure to help. Okay, I'll see you guys. Okay, thanks. Take care. Thanks all. Bye bye. Thanks. See y'all later. Have a good one. Bye. -bye. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you.